I live on Twitter. It's quite a sad existence to be fair, but somehow the level of stupidity on that app never ceases to amaze me. So here we are again after another hot minute talking about our favourite topic, transphobia. I mean, most of you should welcome that considering the majority of my subscribers have come from a video addressing transphobia in a sniper wolf video. Thanks bestie which is apparently now deleted from the video, so will I be taking credit for that? No, I'm not that influential. Anyway, this is another episode of Talking Points. Remember that thing I started a few months ago where I could just talk about drama without having to make it about a certain creator or whatever? Yeah, I, I didn't either, that's why I brought it back. One of the main reasons why any association with the commentary community makes me want to bang my head repeatedly against a wall are the phobic takes that constantly spew out of the mouths of stands, smaller creators and sometimes even bigger creators in that community. Now the take that we are going to look at today is I'm not transphobic, it's just my opinion. Now I argue a lot with people on Twitter, so much that I'm surprised that many of my friends still follow me, and if not, haven't muted me already. And like they try to point out to me, there is literally hardly any point to arguing with them. If someone legitimately uses the argument, I'm not transphobic, it's just my opinion, or any other variant of that phrase, then you are not changing their minds anytime soon. But the reason why it's important to offer an argument to these claims is so that the other people that are exposed to this rhetoric can see the other side. The algorithm is a pipeline and Twitter can be an echo chamber, so if arguing against the argument offers somebody a different perspective, or it helps validate someone who was hurt and felt their gender identity attacked, then that's the only motivation that I need. I don't really care about winning arguments, like, the, what, what's the point in that? Oh, but I'm allowed to have an opinion. Of course you are, but let me stop you right there. If your opinion is transphobic, people are gonna think that you're transphobic. It's kind of how it works. This is quite a popular rhetoric on Twitter, but it started in the commentary community again last month because a trans creator named Jalen made a tweet saying that God isn't real. And to be clear, Jalen also did say some hurtful things and I completely disavow that behavior and I am not supporting that or defending that. However, she has the right to believe that God isn't real. People are allowed to disagree with your belief system, they're even allowed to critique it and comment on it, the only thing they're not allowed to do is stop you from believing what you believe. And critiquing your belief is not jeopardising your right to have that belief. The problem that people have with ideology, whether it be with religious beliefs, cultural beliefs, philosophical beliefs, political beliefs, is their insecurity that is caused when others think differently to them. To one person, their belief system is the ultimate truth, and therefore by default, every other belief system must be false. But the fact that these belief systems exist can be seen as a threat to the validity of their belief system. But instead of accepting that this is the case and choosing to live their lives how they do, they attempt to thwart anybody that disagrees with them. But this isn't all bad. To some, it might be a duty to their god as a servant. To others, it might be because they believe their ideology is the best for the world and therefore they think that they're doing it out of love. However, for those that linger in comment sections on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, 4chan, you name it, it's their undeniable desire to be right, to win the argument, to be the victor. Because your belief means nothing if you can't argue you someone into blocking you on Twitter. That's how it works. Now if people wanted to express this, if they wanted to argue for their belief system, then that is completely fair and they are allowed to do that. They are also entitled to being upset with Jalen, whether that be because of their response about their belief system or for the cold and cruel remarks that they made. But that doesn't justify transphobia on any level. Even if Jalen was the most bigoted person alive, that doesn't excuse any bigotry against her. Where's your Christian faith? Didn't they say that you should turn the other cheek to the person when they slapped you? Or do you just pick and choose what messages you take from the Bible? 
Transphobia is never okay, even against the most disgusting people on the planet. You are still perpetuating the attitude that gender is only valid to those that you believe are worthy. The same can be said about racism, sexism, homophobia, etc. It doesn't matter who the victim is or what they've done, what matters is the message that you are sending. When I defend creators, I don't tend to name them because sometimes the people that experience bigotry experience it as a response to their own failures. And then instead of being seen as someone who is against bigotry, I get accused of blindly defending someone or of being a stan. And that one hurts. Like the homophobic comments that have been made about I'm Alex recently. He said some things in a stream that upset some people and it led to him being called lesphobic. Do I personally think he's lesphobic? No. Do I think that some of the things he said in the stream could be interpreted as insensitive and cold? Of course, if you are a sensitive person, and I think it's fair to criticise that. Some of the people that made the homophobic remarks or supported other tweets or other people making those remarks and death threats are from people who speak up for the LGBT community. A lot of people who were critiquing the use of homophobia were responding with, he was lesphobic. I can't be homophobic. I'm LGBT. If that's the case, he can't be lesphobic because he's also part of that community. It doesn't work like that though, does it? Even if Alex was lesphobic, even if he was the biggest lesphobe in the world, that doesn't justify any homophobia or biphobia towards him. I only decided to put this in the video because it seems to be very commentary community orientated. However, it isn't just the commentary community. That's just where I see it the most. It's simply just people on Twitter. And somehow I find justifying your bigotry by hiding behind your LGBT identity more hurtful than someone hiding behind their right to their opinion. If we allow bigotry in some cases, we are enabling its spread. We are saying that these people's rights and feelings are only valid until we decide that they aren't. I remember at the time Jalen got a lot of transphobic hate and of the tweets that I could find, I'm not putting them in this video. I will keep in tweets of transphobic nature, but none against her. It just doesn't seem right, it doesn't, it doesn't sit right with me. The situation that I seem to be talking about the most started with this Twitter thread where a Twitter user said, there are only two genders. You're not wrong, technically. Non-binary is out of the gender spectrum. There's no such thing as a gender spectrum, but there's such thing as a gender identity spectrum though, no. Gender does not equal sex. They're synonymous. If this was the case, boys that were overly effeminate would just be overly effeminate males rather than transgender women. That is the point! That is the point! Over effeminate males, if they identify as males, are men. Being effeminate is treated like a derogatory concept because it perpetuates the idea that being unmanly is undesirable or wrong if you are a man. Even though societal conventions, which alter as society shifts and changes, determine what is manly and what isn't. If you identify as a man, you are still a man. According to Medical News Today, people often use the term sex and gender interchangeably, but this is incorrect. Sex refers to the physical differences between people who are male, female, or intersex. A person typically has their sex assigned at birth based on physiological characteristics, including their genitalia and chromosome composition. Gender, on the other hand, involves how a person identifies. Unlike natal sex, gender is not made up of binary forms. Instead, gender is a broad spectrum. A person may identify at any point within this spectrum or outside of it entirely. Gender also exists as social constructs, as gender roles or norms. These are defined as the socially constructed roles, behaviours and attributes that a society considers appropriate 
for men and women. A common argument I seem to get or hear is that gender being different to sex and gender being a spectrum is a new concept when it actually isn't. Biologists have started to discuss the idea that sex may also be a spectrum. This is not a new concept but has just taken time to come into the public consciousness. For example, the idea of sex as a spectrum was discussed in a 1993 article published by the New York Academy of Scientists. That was nearly 30 years ago. At birth, female assigned people have higher levels of estrogen and progesterone. Male assigned people have higher levels of testosterone. Assigned females typically have two copies of the X chromosome and assigned males have one X and one Y. Society often sees maleness and femaleness as a biological binary. However, there are some issues with this distinction. For instance, the chromosomal markers are not always clear cut. Some male babies are born with two or three X chromosomes, just as some female babies are born with a Y chromosome. Being intersex can also mean different things. For example, a person might have genitals or internal sex organs that fall outside of the typical binary categories, or a person might have a different combination of chromosomes. Gender identity is how a person feels internally, while their expression is how they present themselves to the outside world. For example, a person may identify as non-binary, but present as a man to the outside world. Most people have a gender identity of man or woman, or boy or girl. For some people, their gender identity does not fit neatly into one of those two choices. They describe gender expression as external manifestations of gender expressed through one's name, pronouns, clothing, haircut, behaviour, voice or body characteristics. Society identifies these cues as masculine and feminine, although what is considered masculine and feminine changes over time and varies by culture. Coincidentally, this addresses this very ignorant tweet. Additionally, there's no way in which a biological male would know how it feels to be a woman. How would he know what it feels like to be a woman? He isn't a woman. There is no way in which he would know what it feels like to be a woman. I'm pretty sure whether or not they'll 100% know what it feels like to be a woman isn't as relevant to identifying as trans as you make it out to be. It is, as they're claiming to be a girl on the basis that they feel like a girl. Why reinforce illusion? They can't know what it feels like to be a girl because they are not a girl. I don't even know what it feels like to be a woman. Does anyone else know? Can anyone tell me? Since we're here, what is that checklist? Is it periods? Because some female assigned at birth people can't have periods. In fact, we stop having our periods at a certain age. Do we then cease to be women? Is it the ability to have children? Well, some of us can't have children. And again, when we get to a certain age, we cannot have children. Does that mean we cease to be women? Chromosomes, as discussed, that can range out of the typical XX. What about intersex? There is no way to measure or determine what it feels like to be a woman. If I said I was a black person on the basis that I felt like a black person, that doesn't make me a black person. It simply means I have body dysmorphia. I cannot know what such a thing feels like. Transracial hasn't been proven. No one believes it other than some dumbasses. I'm comparing the two. They are both forms of body dysmorphia. I'm comparing the two, they are both forms of body dysmorphia. Schizophrenia and depression are both forms of mental illness, that doesn't mean that they are the same thing. That doesn't mean that they can be compared to make a point. You cannot compare two extremely different subjects like race and gender. In fact, the biggest similarity between gender and race is their lack of certain meaning. The identification and expression of gender is different depending on the social, cultural and historical context in which it exists, and race is actually quite similar in its definition. National Geographic notes that race is a concept related to human ancestry. Race is defined as a category of humankind that shares certain distinctive 
physical traits. It is usually associated with biology and linked with physical characteristics such as skin colour or hair texture. However, it is a social construct used to categorise and characterise seemingly different populations. Amy Elizabeth Ansel, in her book Race and Ethnicity, The Key Concepts, wrote that the concept of race was central to historical subjugation of enslaved and colonised populations. The idea that humans can be unambiguously allocated into clear racial groups on the basis of any particular biological criteria has now been discredited by contemporary scientists who distance themselves from the scientific racism of their forebearers. Much more dominant within the literature through the 80s and 90s is the treatment of race as a social construct. According to the racial reformation perspective, race is both an imagined fiction and a fundamental organising concept of the contemporary world. Race may not be real, but as a construct, it does wield powerfully real consequences in terms of identity and social actions. Since the social construction of race is dependent upon specific historical and political contexts, its meanings and practices are by necessity constantly in flux and the subject of contestation. You are treating subjects in a black and white manner, pardon the pun, rather than the incredibly nuanced and complex matter that the subjects actually exist in. I don't know why someone with no knowledge, or it seems to be that you have no knowledge on race and ethnicity, are trying to hypothesize that believing you are black is a form of body dysmorphia. You either are black, have black heritage in your ancestry, or you don't. For example, there may be people that have a fairer complexion and can be said to be white passing, but have recent black ancestry or mixed race or black grandparents, for example. Regardless of such exceptions, your racial identity is made up of a range of different factors that can't be boiled down to a personal sense of self like gender can. And those range of different factors differ dependent on the dominant definition of race at the time or within that culture. And the final point is that you can't change your gender as you can't change your race. You can only change how you identify, how you interpret your gender and how you express it. If you know in yourself that you are a girl, you will always be a girl. But gender seems to exist in a more feminological term, whereas race has a link to ancestry and possible genetics passed down through generations. Also, it is quite difficult to talk about race as a concept because a lot of the characterizations of race are heavily rooted in scientific racism. In this thread, gender has also been attributed to a form of body dysmorphia, when you can be under the trans umbrella and not have any dysmorphia. For example, you can be non-binary and feel no need to change your body. Rather, you will just change the way that you express your gender identity. And I'm sure the same could be applied to trans men and trans women, but I'm neither of those and I don't want to speak on behalf of them. Again, as we move away from sex and gender being synonymous, it is more apparent that there is no reason why someone with traditionally male reproductive organs is a man. However, because of things like body dysmorphia and gender dysphoria, people may change or transition so that they can be more unlike to the sex that society deems to correlate with the gender that they identify as. But how much of that is due to society's classification of sex equally gender? How much of that is down to the want to be recognised as the gender that they identify by a society that perpetuates that sex is gender. If somebody's identity was respected and accepted with no questions asked, how many people would feel the need to transition? I don't know, but I think we underestimate the effect that social norms have on our psyches and our view of ourselves. I'd like to reiterate, by the way, that if you want to change your body, if you want to transition, that is also completely okay. As long as it's not detrimental to your mental or physical health, then it is completely fine to want to change your body, and you don't need mine or anybody else's permission to be able to do that. You shouldn't need that permission. Dysmorphia and dysphoria are both things that people should have access to treatment for. But these are not the cause of being non cis or trans because they are not essential to identifying under the trans umbrella. I'm not transphobic for having an opinion. I am not a 
afraid of transgender people, I think they should receive mental treatment rather than the treatment they currently undergo. Such a treatment, the treatment they have now, simply masks symptoms. Find the root cause and fix it. Are you that painfully thick that I'm gonna have to pull up the definition of transphobia? Transphobia is the fear, hatred, or disbelief, or mistrust of people who are transgender, thought to be transgender, or those whose gender's expression doesn't conform to traditional gender roles. It can take many different forms, including negative attitudes and beliefs, aversion to and prejudice against transgender people, irrational fear and misunderstanding, disbelief or discounting preferred pronouns or gender identity, derogatory language and name calling, bullying, abuse, and even violence. In fact, treating it as a disorder, an illness with symptoms, is also transphobic. No, no, no. I'm sorry, it's just your opinion. Major medical organizations like the American Medical Association and American Psychiatric Association say that being transgender is not a mental disorder. Part of removing stigma is about choosing the right words. Replacing disorder with dysphoria in the diagnostic label is not only more appropriate and consistent with familiar clinical sexology terminology, it also removes the connotation that the patient is disordered. They and other medical experts agree that letting someone transition, which can entail medical treatments like hormone therapy and gender affirming surgeries, without social stigma, is the main treatment for gender dysphoria. In this way, being trans isn't the medical condition. Living as transgender is in fact the treatment to the medical disorder of gender dysphoria. And not all trans people deal with severe dysphoria. It's barely or not present for some trans people, while it is mentally excruciating for others. These facts show that psychological distress and disability aren't inherent to being trans. So being trans doesn't meet the definition of a mental disorder, and therefore doesn't need mental treatment. A psychological state that causes significant distress and disability is the definition of mental disorder, and trans transgenderism does not cause this. The psychological state, the gender dysphoria, is caused by stigma, not the fact that they are transgender. But you're not transphobic, even though you have displayed disbelief that people are transgender, spoken of it like it's a disorder that needs to be fixed and be mentally treated, and discounted a hypothetical identity and chosen pronouns, all of which are transphobic, but you're not, it's just your opinion. I stated my opinion, if you truly think I'm wrong, disprove me. I'm not apologising because I have a separate belief system than you. An opinion can't be proven right or wrong because an opinion is not a fact. The opinions in this video shown by this Twitter user are transphobic. They meet the definitions of transphobia, therefore they are factually transphobic. Now you may argue that having a set of opinions might not make you transphobic. It's quite a concrete label to give someone and I don't think it is as simple as person says one transphobic thing therefore person is transphobic in all of their beliefs. Bigotry has nuances too. We can say that the attitude and opinion surrounding this trans discourse is transphobic. Even though it's your opinion, it doesn't change the fact that it's transphobia. Argue free speech. Argue freedom of ideology. You can physically say and think what you want, but if someone is bigoted, people can say that they are being bigoted. It's just my opinion isn't the defence that you think it is. I would like to relay that message to people who have also been homophobic that I've mentioned in this video, and to anyone that will hide behind their identity, whether that be their gender or their sexuality, whether it be their neurodivergence, whether it be their race. If you hide behind those to excuse your own bigoted opinions, then you are still bigoted. You just don't have the courage to admit that to yourself. I'm gonna go because I've recorded this video for too long and my voice hurts. You'll probably see me getting angry about this on Twitter if you wanna follow me. Please subscribe if you're new or you enjoyed this video. I've said this before, but I'm looking to go into this content and I really do enjoy it. So hopefully you enjoy it too. And with that, I'll see you soon.